Welcome to this video on the Monster Hunters of the United States Government from the World of Darkness setting. What was it that old President Reagan said? The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. The government has been under the influence of, or in opposition to, the various creatures of the World of Darkness since 1776. Despite vampires, mages, werewolves, ghosts, and the occasional fairy handling the levers of power, a few people have managed to peek behind the curtain. I'll be discussing three of the Big Five agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, their history, relationship with the World of Darkness, and a few of the juicy secrets buried so deep that even a master spook couldn't dig them up. But without further ado, we'll start with the premier paranormal intelligence agency of the U.S. government, the FBI Special Affairs Department. The history of the SAD begins with Charles Horner, who made his name in the Bureau of Prohibition, working under the legendary G-Man, Elliot Ness, in Chicago. His investigation brought Horner into the orbit of Alphonse Capone, before Capone joined the brood of Chicago's prince, Loden, and Lone Wolf Lupo, a Garu hitman for the Mafia. Horner's life was changed forever when he was attacked in a warehouse by a vampire and left for dead. But Horner would survive, and it was the beginning of his career as a supernatural investigator. By 1943, Horner was attached to the Office of Strategic Security as part of a team investigating a Nazi spy ring operating out of New York. When the team closed in on the ringleader, Wolf Steger, they discovered that Steger was a vampire after he was shot several times and escaped into the night. In 1952, Horner found a receptive ear in the form of Dr. Emil Zotos, personal psychiatrist to J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the Bureau of Investigation. Together, Horner and Zotos convinced Hoover of the existence of the supernatural and the need for a secret, semi-autonomous department to deal with it. Hoover authorized the creation of the Special Affairs Department in the winter of that year, with the mission of halting subversive activities from groups on the radical fringe of society. In 1955, SAD agents successfully confronted a Brujah Union boss and sent him to final death. The department kept the Brujah's head in a jar, one of the few pieces of conclusive evidence in their vaults. Two years later, in 1957, following the infamous Appalachian meeting between the heads of various mafia families from around the country, J. Edgar Hoover, who had previously denied the existence of the mafia, was forced to not only admit that it existed, but to divert resources towards suppressing it. That meant that the SAD suffered the first of several funding cuts. In 1969, the SAD suffered what was later known as the Big Blowout. The department investigated a man it identified as Dr. Timothy Archer Clark, leader of the Nero Kyrenaic movement, a free love, free mind, free speech movement. The case got even stranger when the agents discovered a link between the Neo Kyrenaics and Louisiana voodooists led by a woman named Denise Girard. Six agents went down to the bayou to investigate the connection between the two groups, but none returned. By the end of the year, Clark and Gerard were in the wind, and Horner had to explain to the aging Hoover how he managed to get six FBI men killed without turning up anything. In 1973, a year after Director Hoover's death, Horner suspected that werewolves also existed within the radical leftist movements in America. Agents converged on the American Indian Movement in connection with the Counterintelligence Program, or COINTELPRO. At the same time, Horner sent agents to infiltrate a radical feminist group known as the Maynads, which Horner suspected was a werewolf front. Horner's suspicions were confirmed, but the investigations cost the department several of their most experienced agents. The next year, Charles Horner died in a hunting accident under mysterious circumstances. His replacement, Andrew Crow, did not break much new ground with respect to investigating the supernatural. Crow spent the majority of his tenure as director cleaning up corruption in the department, but he was forced to retire in 1980 and was replaced by George Thomason, a former FBI homicide agent and protege of Charles Horner. Thomason tracked a vampire serial killer in the late 1960s. Ever since that case, his fear of the things he hunted grew with every passing year. 
While Tonneson successfully killed more vampires than either of his predecessors, he gathered little demonstrable proof of the existence of vampires. Worse, he failed to protect the department's budget. By 1990, the SAD was down to five agents working several cases. Following the successful closure of a case involving a series of blood bank robberies, Thomason launched his most ambitious operation to infiltrate vampire society, which predictably met with failure. In 1993, while under investigation for embezzlement, Thomason suffered a mental breakdown and was involuntarily committed to Bethesda Institute of Mental Health. Thomason was succeeded by his deputy director, Gerard Osborne. Later that year, Senator Jesse Grubhold approached Osborne to enlist the department in finding his granddaughter, Tandy. Tandy Grubhold disappeared when wolves attacked her grandfather's country estate during her coming out party. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Given the senator's importance, a statewide dragnet was put out and the FBI was brought in immediately. While the agents were gathering evidence, a large silver wolf approached the estate, only to be driven off by the agent's gunfire. Senator Grubhold utilized his significant resources to locate and contact Director Osborne and enlist the SAD to find his granddaughter and bring her home safely. In exchange, Grubhold became the department's new guardian angel on the Senate Appropriations Committee, thereby ensuring that the department would have everything it needed, including personnel, equipment, and vehicles. In the intervening two years, the department had several run-ins with werewolves related to eco-terrorism. Agents on assignment in Alaska investigated attacks on a company called Endron Oil, where they saw an Endron employee using a flamethrower against a pack of wolves. When the agents tried to intervene, the man turned the flamethrower on them, forcing the agents to kill the man. The other Endron employees and the wolves scattered, leaving behind a dead man and a dead wolf. An autopsy of the wolf's corpse revealed some anomalies inconsistent with known canid physiology. The department maintains an open investigation into Endron. Two years later, the SAD boasted 23 full-time agents and 12 support staff. What the SAD knows. Vampires have been the primary target of the SAD from its inception. Despite the poverty of samples the department has had to work with, they've managed to identify the major vampire strengths and weaknesses. The SAD knows about the Camarilla in five of its clans, Ventru, Bruja, Tremere, Toreador, and Nosferatu. The department did not learn of the Gangrel until the 1990s, and prior to that believed that they were Bruja. They have yet to identify the Malkavians as a separate clan. The SAD, rightly or wrongly, considers the Nosferatu to be the most dangerous of the clans due to their appearance, powers of concealment, and formidable strength. The second most dangerous were the Bruja, several of whom the department identified as Soviet assets and then inferred subversive intent to the entire clan. The SAD is also aware of the Sabbat, but simply believes the Sword of Cain to be the Camarilla's counterpart, much as the Soviet Union opposed the United States in the game of global hegemony. This theory is supported by the presence of the Camarilla clan's opposite number, the Anti-Tribu, inside of the Sabbat. They have yet to learn of the existence of either the Lasombra, who cannot be photographed, or the Zamitsi, who are as reclusive as they are sadistic. They also have circumstantial evidence related to the existence of a group of vampires standing apart from both Camarilla and Sabbat, with a strong presence in organized crime, the Giovanni. By contrast, the SAD knows little to nothing about the Garu, which it refers to as lycanthropes, and only confirmed their existence in the 1990s. Given the tendency of investigations into werewolves going off the rails constantly, with suspects being tipped off and evidence disappearing, there have been whispers that someone has been sabotaging the department's efforts and has been for a long time. The prevailing theory in the SAD is that only two tribes and a possible third exist the Wendigo, the Uctena, and the Black Spiral Dancers. The SAD rightly recognized that the Wendigo are primarily drawn from the ranks of the native tribes of the northern United States and Canada, and the Uctena likewise come from the tribes of the American South and West. However, the department mistakenly believes that the lycanthropy gene 
only occurs among pre-Columbian people of the continent. As for the Black Spiral Dancers, the department has never knowingly encountered one of the dancers, and only learned of them through surveillance on known lycanthropes. While the department has access to silver pistol rounds, they've never been used by the SAD in the field. But the reasoning follows that if fire and stakes work against vampires, then hopefully silver works against werewolves. With respect to mages, the SAD's library of knowledge is even smaller than with the werewolves. They know the name Cult of Ecstasy from the 1960s and 70s, and regard the cult as another subversive and anti-American element. Yet the cult has successfully frustrated the SAD's attempts at infiltration through inexplicable misfortunes affecting the department's efforts. They've also unknowingly engaged with members of the Order of Hermes and the Verbena, who were masquerading as psychic consultants. The primary tradition that has had contact with the SAD is the virtual adepts, who occasionally penetrate the FBI systems to make sure that no one has any information on the adepts that they should not have. The adepts have even installed a tripwire in the SAD systems that calls out an investigation team if an adept gets cornered by the technocracy. Technocrat policy is to withdraw rather than neutralize reality deviants in the presence of sleepers. Training of an SAD agent. The potential SAD agent has to be recruited surreptitiously, given the nature of the organization and its work. SAD typically recruits from existing FBI agents, but occasionally they'll pull in a promising recruit from the outside, though they still have to graduate from the FBI Academy at Quantico. If the recruit has already been exposed to the supernatural, then the preliminary interview is a bit more forthright. If the recruit passes the interview, they will be asked to sign several secrecy agreements covering pre-employment screening, training, employment, and post-employment. Basically, the contents of which are, keep your mouth shut about anything you see or hear relating to the SAD. The recruit is then subjected to a battery of tests, physical, psychological, and polygraph. Everyone in the SAD is required to take a pre-employment blood test. The department knows what ghoul blood looks like under a microscope. Once that is done and the recruit passes, they are placed under a field supervisor for training, where they learn the history of the SAD, or at least a selectively edited version of it, study dossiers on the supernatural creatures that the department pursues, and receive additional firearms training. If possible, the training agent will try to expose the trainee to a simulated supernatural attack that forces the trainee to evade the pursuer and remove themselves to safety. Passing this final test makes the trainee a junior agent in the SAD, ready to tackle the world of darkness. Maybe. SAD Equipment Every SAD agent is outfitted with the standard equipment of an FBI agent. Badge, gun, car, phone, notepad, and office computer. In later years, SAD agents would likely get cell phones, laptops, and personal devices. As a law enforcement and intelligence agency, they also have, and make use of, the entire range of surveillance and counter-surveillance equipment the Bureau has at its disposal. Cameras, audio recorders, phone taps, RFID and GPS trackers, satellites, pole cameras, stingrays, and so on. The SAD has its own SWAT team, which is trained specifically to deal with the unique threats they face. One SWAT officer had the bright idea to add a hockey net guard to his kit, though it slows his head movement. But better to have and not need than for a vampire to get a free nibble on his neck. The department also has access to a variety of ammunition types, including silver rounds, incendiary rounds, and explosive rounds. Needless to say, Hitting anything center mass with an explosive round is a good way to spoil its day, but it creates a mess of paperwork, part of which is a detailed explanation as just what you were shooting at. In the 1990s, a group of clever agents realized that they could use a combination of infrared and video cameras to identify vampires. While walking around with an infrared camera in hand was dangerous, if they rigged it up in a location they suspected that a vampire would be, then anyone, or rather, anything, that showed up cold on the infrared, but was moving on the video camera, was probably a vampire. 
Of course, this method wasn't perfect, as a few known vampires showed up as normal on the infrared. How they managed to successfully mimic life by throwing off body heat remains a mystery to the department, but it appears it's something that they are capable of, but can either choose to do or not do, depending on the situation. Secrets of the SAD For all of the progress the SAD has made in its brief existence, there is a war brewing inside of its own walls between highly placed agents who have their own loyalties aside from the agency. Loyalties that will eventually collide. The SAD's guardian angel in the Senate, Jesse Grubholb, has not told the SAD the entire truth about himself or his granddaughter. The senator is a Gauru kinfolk. He was partially aware of what he considered to be his family's shameful curse of lycanthropy, but it had not struck in several generations, and he hoped that it had waned. Then, Tandy went through her first change and ran off with a pack of Fianna. Grubholp has not told Osborne what he is or what his granddaughter has become, only that he wants her back home safe and unharmed. He needs the SAD but does not entirely trust them. Tandy is taken up with a heavy metal band and changed her appearance drastically, which might make her harder to locate. Director Osborne does not trust either his assistant director or his internal security chief, and rightly so, but he has opted to keep them close, at least for the time being. Assistant director Cynthia Forrest has spook blood in her veins. Her father was a CIA agent who was murdered in Europe by a Soviet Bruja. Since then, she has had a burning hatred for vampires. She followed her father's footsteps and joined the agency, even volunteered to join the CIA's ultimately failed SAD counterpart. Forrest was then contacted by Dr. Emil Zotos, who extended an invitation to join a group called the Crow's Nest, a top-secret NSA school that trained spies and assassins for the technocracy. Forrest excelled and was planted inside of SAD, where her own competence, and a little aid from Zotos, has propelled her to the number two position in the department. She will back Director Osborne to the hilt, until Dr. Zotos informs her that Osborne is expendable, or that his presence is undesirable to the technocracy. Internal Security Chief Martin Fisk is an agent of Pentex. After washing out of the military, Fisk was picked up by Pentex and trained to join its lethal first teams, where he excelled as a killer of Garu and as a leader. In an effort to gain control of the SAD, Pentex falsified Fisk's military records and got him into the FBI. Fisk has not so subtly urged the department to direct more of its attention to werewolves and their Native American accomplices. He also leads a faction within the SAD known as the Minutemen. The Minutemen regard themselves as good and true American patriots who must, unfortunately, break a few rules from time to time to defend the country that they love, usually by violating people's rights. The Minutemen are quietly preparing a coup against Director Osborne, who they suspect is a bleeding heart liberal. The Minutemen are being funded, in large part, not by Pentex, but by another shadowy group of multi-millionaires known only as the Star Chamber. But the Garou have their own eyes and ears inside of SAD, and have for some time. Marsha Crow, the daughter of former director Andrew Crow and East Coast Regional Director, is a kinfolk to the Silver Fangs tribe. She has the bearing of a New England patrician and the mind of a New York beat cop, which was her job prior to joining the FBI. Like her father, she has taken great care to stymie the department's efforts into investigating or apprehending any of the Garou, regardless of their tribe, while directing their attention towards vampires. Crow leads her own faction in opposition to the Minutemen, called the Underground. The Underground are more interested in investigating and cataloging the supernatural than they are in the Minutemen's corner and kill operations. They number only four after the Minutemen murdered one of their number in the field. Crow and the Underground have allies outside of the department in the form of a group known as Delphi that appears to operate out of the NSA, but seems to be able to walk into or out of any agency they wish. Now, if you've been with the channel for the last seven months, you might know that I have a certain affection for top 10 lists. 
And given that the SAD has its own top 10 list of supernatural creatures wanted for questioning or neutralizing, I couldn't pass up the chance to go over theirs. The number 10 most wanted is an unknown werewolf recorded attacking a vampire in a department store in 1994. The department is less interested in finding this particular lycanthrope than in discovering what, if any, inherent animus exists between vampires and werewolves. Number 9 is a woman who appears human but possesses inhuman longevity and prowess. She imagines herself to be Sherlock Holmes and even wears the cape coat, deerstalker hat, and smokes a calabash pipe while walking around crime scenes with an absurd magnifying lens. However, she saved several police officers and civilians through unclear means. Witnesses give her name as either Sherlock or Charlotte, leading her to be described in the files as Charlotte Holmes. For now, the department wants her for questioning only. Number eight, on the other hand, Michael Standing Tall is the opposite. A known lycanthrope of the Wendigo tribe, he is wanted by several law enforcement agencies, including the SAD, for the murder of two federal agents in 1973. He has been underground since then, protected by his werewolf and mortal tribal affiliates, as well as political organizations related to the AIM. Deadly force is not only authorized, but strongly advised. Number seven is an urban legend that predates the department. Tales of the serial killer known as the Hook, named for its lethal prosthetic and primary murder weapon, date back to 1916. The Hook appears to be a serial killer whose modus operandi is slashing up teenage campers during summer vacations. The department's original theory claimed that the Hook was another vampire. But a fatal encounter in the 1990s between the Hook and SAD agents has led to the conclusion that the Hook does not match vampire or lycanthrope profiles at all, suggesting that the Hook is something that the department has yet to catalog. Number six, Lulu Hagen is an oddity. In 1971, Lulu sent a letter to the SAD addressed to Charles Horner, along with a vial of her own blood. Since then, she has attacked several humans, taking some of their blood and leaving them with two puncture wounds on the neck, but otherwise alive. Between attacks, she has sent the department a series of letters, including nursery rhymes, riddles, and newspaper clippings, taunting the SAD about her prior attacks and giving clues about where she planned to strike next. She has also sent the department several photographs over the years, always dressed as a 1920s flapper and bearing her fangs. Lulu Hagen is likely a vampire, and one who regards this strange game she's playing with the SAD as a way to break up the boredom of immortality. Number five, Denise Gerard, is at least partially responsible for the biggest mass murder of SAD agents in history. The Haitian voodoo leader slipped the net in 1969 during the big blowout and has not been seen since. Originally, the department believed that she was a vampire, but the department's new sources of intelligence suggest that Gerard might be one of the Black Spiral Dancer's tribe. If that is true, any agent encountering her is strongly advised to call in SWAT and use maximum force. Number four is Dr. Timothy Archer Clark, a confederate of Gerard, the Bruja of the KGB, and promoter of the 1960s free love and drug culture. The department strongly suspects that he is more dangerous than Gerard, given his international connections and subtlety. More accurately, Clark is a proponent of Kyrenaicism, a philosophy that propounded immediate physical pleasure and avoiding suffering as the highest good. This has the unfortunate side effect of leaving Clark's cultists effectively burned out and desensitized by the time one of his freedom groups is broken up. Clark was last spotted in Seattle, but he escaped before SAD agents could apprehend him. Unbeknownst to the department, the Kyrenaics are also a romantic society composed largely of unseely fae, which might explain Dr. Clark's longevity and his ability to elude the department. Number three is another classic who predates the department's founding, though this one has an actual name, Wolf Steger. 
The vampire Nazi spymaster who escaped the OSS in New York back in 1943. Or, as he was known in 1994, William Ellis. Interestingly, he is related to the unknown lycanthrope of number 10. Steger, or Ellis, was the target of the werewolf's attack in the department store. Several agents were dispatched to find Steger, but they turned up nothing. Assuming that Steger somehow escaped, he should be considered extremely dangerous. Number two is not a person, but an unidentified group responsible for the June 13, 1995 massacre in Evanstown, Connecticut, that slew nearly all 543 residents of the town. For three days, the people either died of an unknown infection or murdered each other in the streets. All access and communication to the town were cut off. A single survivor reported that he saw men in Rackle spacesuits collecting bodies and taking air and water samples. A CDC contamination team confirmed that the town was hit by an airborne variant of the Ebola Zaire virus. Number one holds a strange place of honor on the list, a kind of memorial to Charles Horner, that is, the vampire who attacked the founder of the SAD in a warehouse in Chicago back in the early 1930s. The only lead the department has is a police sketch, based on Horner's photographic memory. This unknown vampire is a reminder of the mission and the burden that Horner has passed on to SAD agents in the present nights. The CIA. Now for a little palate cleanser before hitting you with some heavy duty stuff. I'll talk briefly about the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. The CIA was created by the National Security Act of 1947, signed by President Harry S. Truman. Subsequent legislation, such as the Central Intelligence Act of 1949, would put the agency in a position that some critics have claimed effectively places it above the law. The operational purpose of the agency is the gathering, analysis, and dissemination of foreign intelligence, as well as covert action on the basis of such intelligence. Most of its processes, operation, records, and budget are confidential. By some quirk of fate, the CIA has never managed to put together the evidence of the supernatural, despite having multiple run-ins with them. Again, the Soviet Brugge have crossed paths with the agency on several occasions. The company has also encountered the Giovanni as they try to identify communist influence inside of European labor unions and later the Mafia's growing control over the international heroin trade. Being dropped inside of the land of black boxes, black bags, and black ops could make anyone just a little bit paranoid. Add in the various denizens of the world of darkness and you have a recipe for insanity. And with that in mind, I introduce senior agent and comptroller Bob Schnoblin, the only man at the CIA who knows, or cares, about what he calls the minions of Satan loose in the world. In 1965, Agent Schnoblin's first brush with the supernatural came when his wife left him for a dark-eyed, unnamed salesman. The only reasonable explanation, in his mind, was that the salesman wielded evil powers that he had used to seduce Schnoblin's wife to the dark side. After several weeks of surveillance and attempts to rescue her, the salesman obviously manipulated her into taking out a restraining order against Schnoblin, so he had to give her up as lost. Yet, Bob Schnoblin was now dedicated to uncovering the forces of Satan wherever he could find them. His dedication, or rather, obsession, got him into trouble with the company, and he was shuffled into a do-nothing section of the missions and program department to rot. Instead, he used his internal exile and senior position to carve out his own niche in the agency he calls Project Black Book. The name is more impressive than the reality. Black Book consists of Schnoblin and whatever junior agents he manages to sucker into working with him, at least until they are promoted up and out of missions and programs. But Schnoblin has collected actual occult artifacts and information, and subsequently assembled it, rather humorously, into his Pyramid of Satanic Power. I now introduce you to that pyramid, one of the greatest pieces of lore in the history of the world of darkness. And there it is. Bask in all of this insanity. As you can see, 
Schnoblin has several accurate names, and he's quite correct in his assessment that the home shopping network is only four steps removed from Satan, and the Giovanni keeping a convent of cute vampire nuns. They'd certainly be a lot more popular than they are, even with the Lamia's curse. The Akashic Brotherhood and the Euthanados would probably be a little bit amused or disgusted that Schnoblin not only mashed them together, but put them under the authority of the Seven Clans, an obvious reference to the Camarilla. And King Ventru 666 is a pretty awesome name for a metal band, or a Mexican luchador. Rest in peace, Prince Mithras. And the Democrat and Republican parties are right at the very bottom, where they belong. I've always liked this thing, not just because it speaks to my own conspiratorial soul, but this is really how an otherwise ordinary human would react and put things together if you suddenly exposed them to the world of darkness, but then gave them every tenth page of the books, shredded them, and told them to put the pieces back together as if their life depended on it. Now I mentioned the interagency group Delphi a while ago. Well, they're aware of Schnoblin and have quietly tried to convince him to drop his personal crusade, if only for his own good. Even if the pyramid of satanic power is batshit crazy and incorrect, he knows just enough truth to be dangerous to himself and others, and possesses more than enough for any number of supernaturals to consider him a loose end in need of tying up. But Schnabler rejected their advice, as they were obviously minions of Satan trying to throw him off the scent, and continued on his doom crusade. The NSA The last government agency I'll discuss is probably the most secretive in the American intelligence community and arguably the most powerful with the growth of electronic communications, the National Security Agency or NSA. The NSA was created by a seven-page, top-secret memorandum from President Truman to Defense Secretary Robert Lovett and State Secretary Dean Acheson, respectively, which remains classified to this very day. The two directives of the NSA are to secure the telecommunications related to the national security of the United States and to obtain foreign intelligence related to telecommunications through interception of signals intelligence. The existence of the NSA remained a secret until it was revealed in 1975 by the Church Committee hearings, which also revealed NSA surveillance of American citizens. But the Church Committee caught just a glimpse of the existence of the secretive, even by NSA standards, Domestic Intelligence Bureau. The DIB handled matters relating to foreign intelligence touching on American soil. But in the 1970s, thanks to the DIB's three subdirectors, it became embroiled in paranormal activities that threatened to not only destroy the Bureau, but damage the NSA as well. Maurice Edwards, Bruce Higgins, and Felicity Price formed the triumvirate in day-to-day -day charge of the DIB, all three experts in computers and data analysis. Edwards used his skill to form the largest sports book in America and to fuel his addiction to gambling. Higgins and Price shared a more than passing interest in the supernatural. They combined their talents and resources to pull in data from all over the country relating to bizarre or occult crimes. Eventually, a pattern emerged from the data that led them to their conclusion. Vampires and werewolves not only existed, but lived among ordinary humans. Thrilled by what they had discovered, Higgins and Price went to Baltimore to test their theory on two vampires they had identified in that city. The two carried out a series of covert operations against the vampires to turn them against each other, undermining their bases of power and framing the other vampire. They installed surveillance equipment and collected data as the vampires raged, retaliated, and ultimately prepared for all-out war. Higgins and Price caught the final confrontation between the vampires on camera as one was sent to final death and the other fell into torpor. They tried to reproduce the experiment in New York but at the time, the city was under the control of the Sabbat, and their annoyance operations only led to shootouts and the murder of humans. They retreated from New York and tried again in Baltimore, this time with a Camarilla vampire and a Sabbat vampire as their subjects. Once again, the operation was successful, as the targeted vampires prepared for all-out war. Except, Higgins and Price were not as careful in covering their tracks as they had been in the past and vampires don't need many clues to follow someone home. One night, 
Bruce Higgins walked into his Fort Meade apartment and found a Sabat vampire named Canterbury waiting for him. Rather than twisting Higgins' head from his neck, Canterbury had a talk with him that ran through the entirety of the night, enlightening the mortal as to the nature of Cain's children and the Sabat's crusade against the antediluvians. Before dawn, Canterbury fed Higgins some of his blood, which energized the NSA agent and cemented his loyalty to the Sabat. Higgins may be a true believer in the Sabat's cause, reinforced by the blood bond, but his Sabat masters hold the NSA in the same contempt as they do all other mortal institutions. Canterbury sees the NSA as a large pot of money that can be dipped from without much oversight, and Higgins is just one of several ladles that the Sabat uses to fund its efforts elsewhere. Like Higgins, Felicity Price drew the attention of vampires, the Camarilla. The power of the Camarilla in the government is largely political, with lobbyists, bureaucrats, politicians, journalists, policy experts, and so on. While the elders have thousands of years worth of knowledge related to human intelligence and real politic, they either cannot, or will not, understand signals intelligence, or the more sophisticated technological methods of data collection and analysis, and have banned their neonates and ancilla from attempting to gain influence over the intelligence community. But a coterie of more technically savvy and daring kindred decided to defy their elders and seize a piece of the pie for themselves. These vampires kidnapped Felicity Price off the street and dominated her into serving them, primarily in monitoring and reporting vampire activity in the United States for masquerade violations. Higgins and Price both returned to work at the DIB, but their productivity declined as they attended to the affairs of their new masters. The first to notice this was Maurice Edwards, their fellow subdirector, who, despite getting in trouble with his bookies, began his own investigation into Higgins and Price's sudden change in attitude and work ethic. Edwards was not only worried about his gambling coming to light, but the higher-ups at the NSA taking a hard look at the DIB and its activities. Meanwhile, the director of the DIB, General Arthur Clifford, a veteran of the Korean and Vietnam Wars and experienced cryptographer, was not only convinced that vampires existed, but that several agents throughout the government had been compromised by them, including his subdirector, Bruce Higgins. He gathered a handful of agents he believed could be trusted and sent them out to the FBI and CIA to learn how far the rot had spread. One of the agents he confided his findings in was his other subdirector, Felicity Price. This turned out to be a grave mistake. Sometime in the late 1990s, several NSA leaders were invited to a demonstration by the Vermont-based think tank Paranormal Research Wing. The PRW showed the military and civilian leaders a device they called a chaoscope, which opened a window into the underworld, where they saw numerous wraiths interact seemingly unaware that they were being watched. But the NSA chiefs were military men and skeptical to boot. They concluded that they were looking at extra-dimensional entities rather than the spirits of the dead. Well, technically true, I guess, but how are aliens hunky-dory but ghost beyond credibility? Anyway, General Rex Shivers authorized a billion dollars to modify the chaos scope so that it could be secretly installed in the White House Shivers observed a White House dinner being attended by a vampire and three ghouls, who appeared on the chaos scope as jet black bodies moving around the room. The black bodies, or blank bodies, as various agents have taken to calling them, led the general to the conclusion that the transdimensional entities had penetrated the highest levels of government. But as high up as Shivers was, he knew that his predecessor, General Arthur Clifford, had been disgraced and ousted as director of the DIB for investigating supposed vampires inside of government. Shivers commissioned several more chaos scopes, this time concealed as ordinary metal detectors, and installed them at the most important locations in the DC area, the White House, the Capitol, the Pentagon, and Dulles International Airport. Only two dozen people in the NSA are aware of the chaos scope operation, including General Shiver and his two immediate subordinates, Colonels Alec Riley and George Johnston, and the other NSA staff monitoring and analyzing the data from the chaos scopes. Shivers is also aware that Higgins and Price are both traitors, and who their handlers are. 
Shivers decided to leave them in place in order to map the hierarchy of extra dimensionals behind them before he takes action against the entire organization. Quietly, Shivers has also begun training a handful of soldiers to fight in armored moon suits with mirrored faceplates and oral blockers. The NSA has not had a direct confrontation with vampires yet, but they may learn that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in the NSA's philosophy. Secrets of the NSA If the government as a whole has been compromised by the various denizens of the world of darkness, then the NSA has been compromised from its very inception. In fact, it was designed to be. But who would do such a thing? Allow me to reintroduce Dr. Emil Zotos, psychiatrist, one of the founding fathers of the SAD, the NSA, and a member of the New World Order Convention of the Technocracy. Zotos is the spider at the center of the US government web and very little happens inside of the intelligence community that either he or one of his agents does not know about. Zotos has been alive since 1910. His longevity was a repayment from a member of the Progenitor Convention in exchange for giving them access to the CDC. In the 1990s, he maintains his cover by pretending to be his own son, aided by powerful but subtle mind procedures. Zotos helped Charles Horner create the SAD, but gave it up in favor of the NSA, where he saw greater potential for shaping the unenlightened masses. His grip on the NSA is near absolute. Dr. Zotos has several mechanisms to affect his will not just in the NSA, but throughout the entire U.S. government. His blunt instrument is a group called the Regulators, a joint program between the New World Order and Iteration X. The Regulators play like something out of Enemy of the State, complete with satellite tracking, phone tapping, hacking, black helicopters, and assassins. For enemies of a more supernatural bent, Iteration X deploys its lethal, cybernetic, hit mark fives. More often than not, the Regulators are a distraction, a little dust in the eyes, to distract the conspiracy theorists and their paranoia-fueled obsession with men in black, while the technocracy tightens its grip by other means. But if the regulators are the hammer, then the crow's nest is the scalpel. Located at a private college in Northern Virginia, the crow's nest trains spies and assassins that the New World Order deploys throughout the government, enlightened and sleepers alike. By the time agents are finished at the crow's nest, they are practically undetectable, even to the point that they can infiltrate supernatural organizations. One exemplar graduate, Cynthia Forrest, is a protege of Dr. Zotos, despite being a sleeper. Senator Grubholz's patronage of the SAD renewed the doctor's interest in the department after half a century of neglect. Thus far, he only needs information from Forrest, but the time may come when the good doctor calls upon the assistant director to use the other half of her crow's nest training and supplant George Osborne as director. However, Dr. Zotos is not content with just weapons. He's also laid a trap within the NSA for anyone who opposes the technocracy. A group calling themselves the Neo-Luddites pretend to stand against anyone who would use technology to control humanity's destiny. But like the Brotherhood of 1984, the group exists as a Judas goat to lure rebels and revolutionaries to their doom before they have the chance to pose a real threat. Members of the Neo-Luddites tend to disappear from time to time or get called on by the regulators. While Dr. Zotos' control over the NSA is overwhelming, it is not absolute. He is well aware that there are vampires trying to find points of entry into the NSA, especially at the DIB. He decided that putting the chaoscopic scanners into play should be enough to scare them off without provoking them to retaliate. Of greater concern are a hacker group inside of the NSA called the Goddamn Magpies. The Magpies are information collectors and disseminators, responsible for several embarrassing leaks in their brief existence. More troubling to the technocracy is that the Magpies are getting outside help from the Garu of the Glasswalkers tribe. The Lupines and the Magpies have traded information, mainly having to do with Pentex, and even saved each other's lives on a few occasions. The goddamn Magpies will have to be... terminated, 
before they become a problem and release something truly damaging to the agency and the technocracy. Like, say, a program of mass surveillance and metadata collection on every citizen of the United States. Just as a possible example. The top threat to the technocratic control of the NSA comes from a group called Delphi. Delphi is a group of awakened mages from several traditions, including the Virtual Adepts and the Order of Hermes, who have managed to create an interagency task force right under Dr. Zotos' nose and planted their bona fides and credentials so deep in the federal system that they can access any facility or information they want. Delphi's goal is to break the technocracy's hold on the NSA and have formed a tentative alliance with Marsha Crow and the Underground over at the SAD. But they haven't revealed their true nature to their FBI acquaintances just yet. And a smaller, but no less dangerous player in this NSA drama is the Star Chamber. The Star Chamber is a 200-year-old businessmen's club located in Boston, Massachusetts, whose membership includes some of the wealthiest old money Brahmins in New England. Most of the upper echelons of the Star Chamber are ghouls. A few have been alive since the club's founding. Their goal is simply to acquire more money and power for themselves. And information is as important as money in the game that they play. To that end, the Star Chamber finances the Minutemen in the SAD to maintain a pipeline of information on the caitiffs and anarchs they hunt to maintain their supply of vitae. On the NSA side, their point man is DIB subdirector Maurice Edwards. The Star Chamber was very sympathetic to his plight as a compulsive gambler, and they purchased his debts, allowing him to repay them in intelligence, financial, industrial, political, whatever he can lay his hands on that would give them an edge. The technocracy not only knows about the Star Chamber, but one of their number is a member of the club and keeps the syndicate apprised of the Star Chamber's plans. However, the Star Chamber plays a dangerous game in its pursuit of stolen immortality. While they take great care to not fall afoul of either the Camarilla or the Sabbat, mistakes have been made, and one day, the Star Chamber will make their last mistake. On that day, all of their money and schemes will be meaningless before the wrath of the children of Cain. And that concludes this kind of strange lore video on the monster investigators and hunters of the US government. Supernaturals rightly fear the wrath of the government and let's face it, if you don't, then you haven't been paying attention for the last century or so. As a matter of logic, they need not be though, because the government suffers from the same weaknesses as the supernaturals. Government agencies tend to be paranoid, greedy, and territorial as any vampire elder. Trying to get cooperation between agencies, bureaus, and departments is like trying to pull teeth with no anesthetic and a greasy set of pliers. Expect resistance, failure, and a lot of crying. Anyway, I was going to save the imbued from Hunter the Reckoning for last in this series on Monster Hunters, but I've changed my mind. They'll be next. They don't have any real dense history to them, but I'll come up with something. Until next time.